So, you're looking at your hometown and you think, hmm, this place needs an airport. Well, you've come to the right place. In today's video, we'll look at the process of opening your own commercial airport from start to finish. Do keep in mind that this video will be a massive oversimplification, but I'll try to be as accurate as possible. Before the video starts, please consider subscribing. We're so close to 1000 subscribers, so please help me reach this goal. Thanks and on to the video. First of all, you need to select a location. I will select a place in Europe since I'm the most familiar with regulations here. The process will likely be similar in other parts of the world. Airports in the European Union are regulated by three agencies, the International Civil Aviation Organization or ICAO, then the European Aviation Safety Agency or EASA and by national civil aviation agencies. To operate a commercial airport here, your fledgling new airport has to receive certification from the National Civil Aviation Agency, which adapts regulations from EASA in the form of Certification Specifications, or CS, which itself adapts its regulations from the ICAO in the form of ICAO Annex 14. Don't worry, this is the least complicated part of the process. There are a few exceptions for this, like if your airport gets less than 10,000 passengers per year, but come on, if your airport has slightly more people going through it per year than the population of Condom France, what are you even doing? So, back to the location. I will select the city of Ústí nad Labem in the Czech Republic, the most prestigious city in this country. After you decide where you want your new shiny airport to be, you'll have to secure financing. After all, building a new commercial airport from scratch isn't cheap. If you want to retain ownership of your new airport, there are two ways of securing financing, either through a public-private partnership or funding it with private capital. A public-private partnership is exactly what it sounds like, the public and private sectors partnering up to build something, usually a large infrastructure project like an airport. If you decide to go the fully private route, you would have to be mega rich yourself or you'll have to convince very wealthy people and or banks to invest in your new airport. This comes with risks, because building a whole new airport from scratch is risky, but let's say that you successfully secure the funding you need. Back to our plan, we will have to select a location, preferably somewhere far away from people's houses to avoid noise complaints. After that, we need to report our intention to open an airport to the Czech Civil Aviation Authority. Next up, we need to conduct an Environmental Impact Assessment, or EIA for short. The purpose of the EIA is to thoroughly assess the impact our new airport would have on the environment and people around it. Issues that would have to be solved include stuff like noise, runoff from defrosting chemicals into drinking water, interference with wildlife habitats, especially bird habitats, among others. The process of completing an EIA goes roughly like this. First, you must notify the appropriate regional government, which in our case is the Ústí regional government. Then, you must conduct an extensive study of the impact your project will have on the environment. After completing this step, the findings are made into a comprehensive document and sent off to the relevant government agencies. After public hearings, considerations and a few other steps, the government decides whether to approve or reject your project. Of course, this is a massive oversimplification of the process, but it's roughly how it goes. Let's say that you successfully jump through all the hoops you need to get your new airport approved and you can start building. Well, the headaches don't end there, because... After you get your construction permit, don't start celebrating yet, the headaches are only beginning. We have to consult the ICAO Annex 14 regulation, EASA CS and our national laws for guidance. The terminal building itself is relatively lightly regulated, meaning that you have more freedom in how you want to build it and how you want it to look. Of course, you have to provide essential airport services like check-in, airport security, gates, defrosting, among others. You also have to provide firefighting and paramedic services, but the look of the building is mostly left up to you. In contrast, runways, taxiways and airplane parking spaces are tightly regulated. Everything from the minimal width of the runway, to the clear zone of the runways and taxiways, to the width of the markings, it's all stipulated by laws and regulations. For example, Czech laws stipulate that grass along the runways and taxiways has to be shorter than 35 cm. Back to our construction. Airports are classified into two character codes based on the wingspan of the largest plane that is allowed to land there and on the runway length it needs to take off. Let's say that we want our airport designed primarily for smaller planes like the Airbus A320 and Boeing 737. I'll take the largest of the A320 and 737 families, the 737 MAX 10 and Airbus A321 XLR. 
Both the A321 and 737 have roughly 36 meter wingspans and under maximum takeoff weight they need roughly 3 km or 1.8 mile long runways to take off. So according to this table our airport will be classified as 4C. Both the A321 and 737 require at least 30 meter wide runways. So, to serve fully loaded 737 and A321 flights, we need to build a runway which is at least 3 kilometers or 1.8 miles long and at least 30 meters or 98 feet wide. Of course, to get to and from the runway, our new airport needs taxiways and the width is regulated as well. Our taxiways have to be at least 15 meters wide to serve the A321 and 737. After we pave our runway and taxiways, we have to place markings on it. The size and shape of markings are mandated by EASA certification specifications. For example, the length of the lines in the middle of the runway plus the space between the lines must be longer than 50 meters or 164 feet, but shorter than 75 meters or 246 feet. For our runway, the width of the lines must be at least 45 centimeters or 1.47 feet. There are a billion more markings, but I don't want to make this video 2 hours long, so let's move on. You successfully paved your runway and taxiways and managed to stay within the legal definitions of the marking on said roads. Great, now you need to install lighting. Every larger airport you see is equipped with arrays of lights to safely bring planes down. We will have to install these as well to comply with regulations. After you set up lighting, we will have to provide weather services to the airport. A weather station has to be set up to measure and provide weather forecasts, especially for rainfall, temperature and wind speed. Then, we will have to establish air traffic control services. This entails registering with the Air Traffic Control Agency of the Czech Republic, hiring air traffic controllers, building a control tower and registering with Eurocontrol. Eurocontrol is the pan-European air traffic control agency, which provides smooth integration of air traffic control services with the whole continent. At last, we have to get our ICAO and IADA airport codes. You are probably most familiar with IADA codes, since they are the most recognizable free letter codes that some airports, like the Los Angeles LAX airport, base their whole brand around. In contrast, ICAO codes are four letters long and the first two signify the location. So, we could choose our IADA code to be UNL, as in Ústí nad Labem. Our ICAO code has to start with LK because that's the code for the Czech Republic, but the last two letters are up to us. I'll choose LKUS as in Ústí. Let's say that you get all that, plus the things I didn't mention done and your airport is ready for operation. What now? Well, now you've got to attract business. Your new airport has several potential ways of making money. The first and most obvious way is to attract commercial airlines to fly there. The most likely candidates to fly to Ústí nad Labem are budget airlines like Ryanair, EasyJet or Smartwings. Perhaps they could market it as a gateway to the Bohemian Switzerland National Park or something. After you successfully convince an airline to fly to your airport, you can charge them for services such as cleaning, refueling, defrosting, baggage handling, etc. Most airports also charge a fee for landing, takeoffs, and using airport facilities such as gates or check-in desks. Alternatively, you could try to attract flight schools to set up operations at your airport by charging them discounted rates or giving them preferential treatment. Another source of revenue is renting out commercial space inside the airport terminal to various restaurants, retail stores, souvenir shops, and others. Some airports take a cut of revenue on top of a fixed rent payment, while others just charge rent. Another big source of revenue for airports is parking. Storing people's cars in front of the building is a lucrative business for airports around the world. Now that you've got your airport up and running, enjoy the stress of managing a commercial airport. I hope you enjoyed the video, thank you so, so much for watching to the end. This has been Tramley and I'll see you next week. Bye.